Laudetur Jesus Christus, may Jesus Christ be praised. On the first Sunday of Lent, traditionally the gospel reading is about the temptation of Jesus in the desert before the beginning of his mystery. This year at St. Matthew's, however, our theme is songs of redemption, and it will guide us through the next 40 days. Despite what you may think, I had nothing whatever to do with choosing that theme. Song and singing is a part of the natural life of us humans. And making sounds, which we might consider singing, is also natural to many animals. Just ask my greyhounds. I would bet that there is not a single person here, or a married one either, who does not sing in the shower or hum to him or herself, who enjoys the sound of your voice echoing in a mountain valley, um, or who does not listen to music at least once in a while. Lent has the reputation of being a season when we stop ourselves from doing things we like. We impose some hardship on ourselves and we meditate on the ghastly suffering and death of Jesus. Because Lent calls us to repent, and that means penance, penance, punishment, or other mostly negative concepts that we may think somehow will make us better Christians. While there is a long tradition of thinking that making yourself miserable is a good thing, I think it is in fact antithetical to the spirit of repentance. In the ancient tradition that comes down to us from time long before Jesus, there are three things which we should do to recast ourselves. Fasting, almsgiving, and prayer. First, fasting. Fasting means giving up something essential for a period of time. Food, drink, coffee, chocolate, a martini, I'm sure you can think of other things that people give up for Lent. But the point is not the giving up, essentially, especially if that makes you a grump. Fasting reminds us that we need to be right in relationship with the world around us, that food and drink and coffee and chocolate and a glass of wine or a nice sleep in on a cold morning are wonderful things. By not indulging in these pleasures for a time, we are reminded that they are indeed wonderful and that we need to remember that and not take them for granted. Second, almsgiving means giving something of value to someone or some cause that is in need. Traditionally, this is feeding the hungry, giving clothing to the naked, providing shelter to those in need, etc., etc., etc. You know all those things. I'm sure you can think of many other examples that I did not cite here. This is not merely to help those less fortunate so that we can feel better about ourselves. Almsgiving reminds us that we are in this together and that when one of us is hurting, we are all less than whole. Third, prayer. Prayer is something we all know about but it is also something we need to experience more and more in a deeper and deeper way. Sometimes that means evaluating how and when we pray. Sometimes it means trying a new way to pray, like coloring. Prayer essentially is about our relationship with God. And like any relationship, it takes some time and energy and often some time alone together. These three traditional practices reminds us of our relationship to creation around us, to the people around us, and to the God who surrounds us, whether we are aware of that divine presence or not. Lent calls us to reconsider our place in creation, in community, and in our friendship with God. And that is indeed a cause for singing. Either we are rejoicing in how wonderful it is that we can see ourselves as part of God's life and as part of God's plan for the world and for us, or we are singing the blues because we know that something is out of whack, or maybe both at the same time. 
The scriptures that we heard this morning might seem a bit of a stretch for the theme, Songs of Redemption, but let me suggest a few ideas. And I didn't forget, here is the rumination banner. Read for yourselves the entire book of Jonah. It will take you about 15 minutes. In the Bible in my office, it's two and a half pages. It's not very long, it's four chapters. We did not hear chapter two today. Chapter two is Jonah's prayer to God while he is in the belly of the whale, or whatever that animal was. It's sort of the blues, but it ends with confidence in God's ability to save Jonah even when he's stuck inside that giant fish. But what we don't get from the reading we had today was Jonah's own prejudice, which he sees as completely in line with God's plan. Jonah hates the Ninevites. Those people are cruel, they are evil, they are depraved, and they are the enemies of God himself. So it must be some weirdness that the message to go preach repentance to the city of Nineveh came to him. Because all we know, because we all know, that we hate everything that is opposed to God. And you know Jonah's response to that call. He was called to go east, so he went west. But what happened was, he was followed by a fish that spit him up on the shores of Nineveh, which must have been quite a long time to go around Africa and up through the, but anyway. But what made Jonah even more angry is that when he preached, they listened. We know that happens once in a while. (laughs) Read the rest of that book. It's just one chapter, chapter four. It's only 11 verses. You can do it, I'm sure. Read Read the book to see how obstinate Jonah is about what he knows is the will of God, even if God himself tells him and shows him something different. In the gospel passage, Jesus has a conversation with this pagan woman whose daughter is possessed. There's lots we could spend time on in this story. Mark's version in chapter seven is only six verses long and has more details, despite the fact that Matthew's gospel tells us less in a longer passage. Scripture scholars aren't quite sure what to make of the difference between these two versions, and personally, I prefer Mark's version, although Matthew has his own points to make in the way he presents the story. In case you didn't hear Matthew's version, here it is again. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, "'Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David,' My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And the disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away. She keeps shouting at us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. Here's what we read at Mark 7, 25 through 30. A woman whose daughter had an unclean spirit heard about Jesus, and she came and fell down at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a physician a race, by race a Phoenician from Syria and she started asking him to drive the demon out of her daughter. He responded to her like this, let the children be fed first, since it is not good to take bread out of the children's mouths and throw it to the dogs. But in response, she says to him, sir, even the dogs under the table get to eat the scraps dropped by the children. Then he said to her, for that answer, be on your way. The demon has come out of your daughter. She returned home and found the child lying on the bed and the demon gone. 
there are a couple noticeable differences between these two versions. Matthew has the disciples complaining about this bothersome woman who just won't go away and leave them alone. Mark has none of that. Matthew has the woman addressing Jesus saying, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. Again, Mark doesn't have anything of that. He simply says that she asked Jesus to heal her daughter. Both versions has the bit about children and dogs. As an aside here, the word for dogs used in both versions is the Greek word kunaria, which means puppies or small dogs. Some scholars try to make a lot of that small or baby or cute dog thing. But if you look at the text itself, Jesus is calling the woman a dog. And does it matter too much whether he calls her, using English vernacular here, whether he calls her a bitch or a little bitch? And finally, Jesus has to tell the woman that her daughter is healed because of the faith that she has shown. Mark, on the other hand, writes, Jesus said to her, because of your answer, be on your way, the demon has come out of your daughter. Mark has Jesus being pleased with the women's quick, woman's quick wit, not her faith, whatever that might mean right here, right? In any case, this woman has every reason to sing praise of God's mercy. Her daughter has been healed. Her prayers have been answered. What do these scriptures teach us about Lent, about songs of redemption, and about our lives here and now? Take some time during the week to ponder the two stories, but let me make a few suggestions. Jonah prays to God even when he's in the belly of the whale, knowing that God is just, and when it comes down to us, comes down to it, God is in control of everything and most importantly, he is merciful even to those of us who directly contradict his commands. The story of Jonah reminds us that God's will will be done in heaven, but also here on earth. That sounds a bit like a prayer we all use. The story of the Syrophoenician woman suggests that we need to be confident that God will provide what we need even if we might be something of a bitch from time to time. The version that Matthew tells reminds us that having faith in pr the promises of God is important, and trusting in those promises will get us through. Mark's gospel reminds us that Jesus, who is the self-revelation of God the Father, will give us what we ask for, even at a distance. Remember, Jesus never went near that little girl who was possessed. Perhaps because we have used our own wits to deal with the problem, like the woman in the story. And finally, God is not without a sense of humor. Just look at those of us in charge. As you know, I think the hymns of the church are not only tunes that we know, but pro poems that we should pray. So would you look please in the black hymnal at number 2027. Number 2027. You'll have to pray this to the choir since they don't have this. Let us pray together. Now praise the hidden God of love in whom we all must live and move, who shepherds us at every stage through youth, maturity, and age, who challenged us when we were young to storm the citadels of wrong, in care for others taught us how God's true community must grow, who bids us never lose our zest, though age is urging us to rest, but prove to us that we have still a work today, a place to fill. Amen.